Welcome to our next Career Fair talk, everyone. With Code Red for Humanity announced this year, we are urged to assess the sources of our emissions. Up to 15% of greenhouse gas emissions can be traced back to livestock farming alone, compared to 2% from aviation. It is therefore obvious that in order to reach net zero emissions by 2050, we need to dramatically shift the way we eat and produce our food. One possible solution for this problem is lab-grown meat. Our next speaker, Maria Fernandez, is an IPSC and tissue engineering scientist responsible for cell line development at Mirable. Mirable is an innovative Dutch food company aiming to deliver at scale the new natural cultivated meat that looks like, tastes like, and has the nutritional profile of traditional meat. Let's hear more about how Maria chose her path and consider whether you may want to follow a similar one. Maria, you can start presenting. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, uh, Sadil. Just start sharing my screen. Let me know if it's all okay. All right. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizers of the Horizons uh, Fair for uh, having me here. Uh, and it's the first time that I'm doing uh, this sort of, of presentation. So I'll slowly introduce what we're doing at Meetable, uh, the type of uh, jobs that we have at Meetable, actually. And uh, I'll discuss a little bit about my career path and how I ended up uh, doing the job that I'm doing. Um, so as a short introduction, uh, I'm currently, uh, my name is Maria Gomez Fernandez. I'm, I'm the team lead of the cell line development at Meetable. Uh, I started as a scientist uh, in 2019, and now I'm leading a team of five people, a team that it's actually growing now, which is also quite exciting. Um, and what, what are we doing at Meetable? So at Meetable, we love meat. Uh, we do see it as an essential part of a balanced diet. Um, but we think that how meat reaches our tables right now, it's not, um, it's not ideal. So we don't love industrial farming um, and it's, it's bad for the planet and it's, it's terribly cruel for the animals. And as Sarah uh, uh, nicely introduced, we are developing a, a different way of, of, of getting meat into people's uh, table. Um, so as as you know, uh, um, industrial farming as it is right now, it's unsustainable, and we need a new natural. Uh, so we, you all are aware, and, and there's a lot of buzz and a lot of discussion about this uh, right now. Like a lot of land uh, is being used to feed livestock, and, and this industry actually is quite it's responsible for a big amount of greenhouse emissions. Um, also, a lot of the antibiotic produced globally are actually <laughs> used in the livestock farming and over 6 billion uh, land animals are reared every year. Uh, and we want to have an impact on, on, this, on these terms. Um, so uh, actually the past year and the past in also 2021, there has been an increase in awareness of the role of industrial farming also in future pandemics, as we all uh, uh, heard about this, right? Um, so, how, how do we want to do this? Uh, I would just want to, to let you know a little bit of, of what are the different things and how we see this whole process working. So we start with the good cell bank, which is actually the, the, the role of my team. Uh, and we move from a sea train to a, a quite a big uh, bioreactor upstreaming because this needs to be uh, uh, working in big quantities to be uh, valid, right? Um, so after we expand these this cells, uh, we need to differentiate them into muscle and fat. And that's what the tissue uh, engineering team will do downstream. Uh, we add cross media sourcing, you know, amino acids, vitamins, uh, salts, glucose, uh, uh, to make this whole process. And then you go to the food science part, which is how the meat is processed and uh, packaged and uh, distributed. So this is a little bit of, of an overview of, of our uh, pipeline. Um, so what are we doing differently and what, what, what are the things that we're betting at, at Meetable to make this happen? So we have... Uh, sorry, Maria, yes. uh, is it okay if you speak a bit louder? Yes, of course. Uh, can you hear me better now? Yes, I think that's... All right, uh, I'm really sorry for that. Um, so how, how do we make... We have, we're working on key essentials at, at Meetable to make this happen. And the main one um, that we're working with is this OptioX uh, expression. 
which help us to differentiate uh, our IPS cell lines and uh, will create a fundamental cost and scalability advantage. So it will help us to guide our cell lines to differentiate into muscle and fat at a higher efficiency. Uh, at the same time, we need to make this whole process um, money-wise equivalent to the real needs. Um, so how do we do that? We need to, a lot of what we use in terms of growth factors and vitamins are quite expensive to source. So we're working on uh, growth factor replacement solutions uh, so we can have a competitive price uh, uh, compared with traditional meat. And then, of course, another thing that we're really working on is that we'll have uh, a type of tissue, not only a minced meat solution or a meat, a paste meat solution, but also uh, a proper tissue. And for that, we need um, hardware that will ensure good quality product and then we can mimic uh, um, how a tissue grows, how a muscle grows. Um, and we're very convicted that um, using the most suitable cell type is what will drive this process. So we're very convicted that using iPSCs uh, will determine uh, uh, the future of, of, of this field actually. And, and that's where I, my team and that's where I'm working with. Um, so we we always discuss the cell economics, uh, which means that uh, it's the efficiency of which animal cells can turn into meat, given their nutrient uh, conversion efficiency and uh, how much you need to spend in terms of media for their proliferation speed and potential. And that's why also the OptioX system that we use contributes a lot for this uh, perspective. Um, in terms of current projects, uh, so you guys understand a little bit in terms of, of research and development, what are the main things that we're working with? What are the type of scientists that we have on board? Um, so from the cell line development, we are working with iPSCs from different species. We're exploring uh, transcription factors for the reprogramming of, of cells into iPSCs. And we're optimizing this overexpression system. We're optimizing differentiation system. Uh, but we also have a very big team from ingredients, which is looking at the optimization of the growth factors. And of course, a very important part, substitution of non-food ingredients, because a lot of what we're using is based on pharma products, but they need to be adapted to a food uh, uh, perspective. Uh, and then tissue engineering, where they're working a lot with 3D differentiation of muscle and fat. They're working with scaffolds, biomaterials, optimization of differentiation protocols. And you have the bioreactor and upscaling where they're uh, working on the large scale growth of the iPSCs. Uh, they're uh, working on scaling up solutions, media recycling solutions, for example. And these teams are composed for different, different types of, of, of scientists. You have cell biologists on board, molecular cell biologists. You have biomaterial scientists, uh, people coming from the biomedical engineering, biochemists, chemists, bioprocess engineering, and even mechatronics engineering. Uh, because one of the big things is also that we will be able to um, make this as 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 a, a whole production uh, factory, and we can automatize it as well. On the other side, um, we need a full team to help us with this. So besides the R and D, uh, we need a team that will help us moving from the research and development to the product itself. And we have a very important lab management team uh, that makes sure that lab safety and implementation of all regulations are, are, are it's being done, that take care of the maintenance, storage, inventory, uh, the design and implement the lab in the lab laboratory spaces according to specific needs, uh, quality assurance, quality control. They make sure that policies and procedures are implemented before or during the production. They test the processes uh, and make sure that everything uh, to ensure the correct parameters are met. So uh, food safety and regulatory, also very important uh, uh, part of what we're doing, making sure that we're uh, doing everything in terms of food safety practices, uh, that we can, our food products can are approved. Uh, so they have a very big uh, contact with regulatory agencies to make sure that uh, we're doing everything correctly. Uh, and they're directly involved with the quality insurance, uh, quality control, and laboratory management. And then, of course, we have all the team involved in the business strategy and project development, uh, which is the team that drives the business. 
uh, in the future directions. They manage all the stakeholders, they manage the people interested in this, and uh, they understand the science and the process, and uh, they put all this together, make sure that timelines and strategies are uh, met. And these people, you might not imagine, they also come with a good uh, uh, food scientist, of course, but they all have also scientific background. And what I want to explain to you uh, during this talk is that uh, there's more than just the R&D, there's more than just the research part of it. You can also move to this type of jobs within a company, which is a little bit different than you would do uh, uh, in academia. Um, so this being said, uh, I just want to explain a little bit how me coming from a, an academic uh, environment uh, ended up here, um, admissible and, and what were the things behind my thought, why did I do it? So uh, as a background, I'm a stem cell research and developmental biologist. So I started, I'm from Portugal, by the way. So I did my bachelor in genetics and biotechnology uh, in the north of Portugal, a very nice uh, university there. And I was very interested in genetics, in biotechnology, biology, and biochemistry. And it was there that I first started uh, doing some in vitro culture of animal cells, which is something that I always uh, enjoyed a lot. And I started working also, I had the first touch upon molecular and cellular genetics and biomaterials. But for me, one of the biggest uh, things that I was always interested in, I always found it fascinating, is how from one cell we get a complex organism. So how is this controlled? Uh, so I always wanted to know a little bit more uh, about that, and that's when I decided to do my master uh, studies in developmental and evolutionary biology. And here I moved to Portugal, uh, where uh, main topics was regarding genes and molecules in development, evolution in development, bioimaging, and did very interesting courses in stem cell biology and technology which then made me a um, second year project. Uh, I wanted to do something with stem cells and that's where I actually met my uh, master's supervisors there. And that's when I moved to actually to the Netherlands to finish my master's uh, uh, science uh, part. I did my master's dissertations in Leiden uh, in the LMC in the Netherlands. Uh, my supervisor was uh, Susanne Schuva. And I worked a little bit with uh, dynamics of X chromosome and activation in humans. So still for me, I was still very interested in, in how you come from one cell to a complex organism. Um, so there was something always behind how, 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 how is this controlled? And um, I decided to stay in the Netherlands. I was invited to stay and do my PhD uh, with the same group, uh, but then shifting a little bit of direction and uh, I worked a lot uh, with BNP signaling and uh, my PhD thesis was uh, a lot regarding how do cells communicate during cell culture, how do they decide to stay pluripotent or how do they decide to become something else. And BNP signaling is also very important signaling involved uh, during development in the uh, differentiation to germ cells. So that was the main topic of my uh, thesis actually. Uh, and I worked a lot with mouse embryonic stem cells, human embryonic stem cells, human induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, closely related to human embryonic development, pluripotency, differentiation, cell, seg cell signaling. Those were, those were my main topics. Um, later on, I decided I continued uh, a little bit through these routes, uh, also in line in the LMC, where I did a, a postdoc project uh, regarding safety of human induced pluripotent stem cells for gene therapy. Uh, which was also very interesting. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I reached a point in my career that I was trying to understand if I wanted to stay in academia or not to stay in academia. So I was, uh, for me, um, I always like this cartoon because it tells me that there's a lot of the impact of, of what I, how academia was feeling for me at the time, that uh, at the beginning you have all this freedom, you think, oh, I'm going to research wherever I want. Uh, and then in the end, you're doing research because uh, you get a grant out of it. So you get, uh, you think that you have this freedom in academia and I felt that it, it gets lost somehow. And also I think that the main careers that you get 
in, in academia that gives you stability, it's always when you become a full professor. Anything in between there, uh, it's a little bit uh, depending on grants and how things go. And I really didn't want that. So I started uh, looking for other things. Uh, and that's actually when uh, Meetable came into my path. Um, so what I was looking for, I was looking for a job with uh, clear objectives. Uh, I was looking for a chance to grow within the job and the company, uh, a place where still my technical skills and knowledge are challenged, but something interdisciplinary. Uh, and I also wanted to acquire other type of skills like uh, management, public outreach, uh, learn a little bit of outside of, of the science also. Uh, but of course, for me, it was very important to have a great work ethics and a great impact and vision. And of course, I was also uh, wondering what can I offer as, as a scientist that has been in academia and that has been uh, in this path, what is it that I can offer to a company besides my scientific knowledge? Um, and this is where I had to learn a little bit of what are my other skills besides being really good at researching something, uh, being knowing uh, a lot of the scientific uh, knowledge behind something. What are the other skills that you develop um, meanwhile, right? And I think that uh, most of them has to do with time management, uh, resilience, because we all know that being in a lab sometimes things don't work at first. Uh, you have to do a lot of planning. It also involves with project development. Um, you need to acquire good communication skills. Uh, I had the chance to mentor and teach uh, students, which I, I always enjoyed a lot. Uh, establishing collaborations, uh, uh, have a lot of teamwork and meeting deadlines. So it, it's a little bit of a shift of, of how you think about your main competences. Um, and that's a little bit of the message that I wanted to say. Uh, with this talk is that um, what you bring to a company, uh, it's not only your technical skills and knowledge, but also this type of management skills that you inherently acquire during your academic path. Because um, most of the times you need to learn how to value and speak about those aspects besides your knowledge of science, besides your publications, besides your uh, skills into uh, in the lab. You need to valorize, I think, all the other skills. And uh, I think that you're in the academia path. You're not used to do that. Um, and and it, it's a very good bridge uh, to switching um, environments. Um, so I, that, that's a little bit of, of what I learned also uh, in this path. And that's uh, how I started up at Meetable. And now I'm uh, not only doing a little bit of science, I'm also guiding a team and I'm being involved in uh, other aspects of the company uh, because Mutable is still a startup. Uh, and that's been really fun for me. Um, and of course, I think that the, the decision has to do with uh, what is it that you want to do? What are the things that you're looking for? Um, and then move from there. I think that uh, that's, that's my main message for uh, this this topic, and I think, uh, yeah, that was my last slide. I think uh, we can move for we can move from some questions. Thank you for your interesting talk, Maria. So we have a few questions. Uh, first of all, Camilo Torres asks, "What do you guys think of your competitors, like Beyond Meat and other meat alternatives? Do you see them as competitors?" Or, and how do you think your product has the potential to be better or different? Yes, that's always a, that's always a, a good question. So uh, beyond meat, uh, so they're plant-based, right? Uh, um, we see what we're doing as giving people an alternative. Uh, we don't see as completely change or we don't see as completely replacing all the other, uh, all, uh, all the other uh, industries, but we want to give people an alternative. We want people that are worried about how the world is going. But there's also a lot of people that don't want to necessarily stop eating meat. They still like the taste of meat. Uh, we really want to appeal to the to the carnivores out there uh, <laughs> and give them an alternative to, to, to the industry. Yeah. So we don't see them per se as competitors, but we're working in the same direction. Yes. Yeah. I agree with the sentiment. Sinem <laughs> uh, Apaidin wants to know, what would you recommend to someone with a purely academic background 
if they would like to switch to a QA or QC directly after their PhD? What skills would you look for in these candidates? Thanks. All right. So uh, for what I learned of people that are working in QA, QC, these are people that are very, uh, uh, they work a lot with details. They're very good at, at making sure that, that all the details are there, that, uh, that you know how a process works and that you know what are the main things that you need to control for that. And they're very good at looking into details. They have very good, um, yeah, they, they're very good at writing reports. They're very good at uh, uh, writing SOPs. They're very good at making sure that the process flows as it should. So if you come from a from an academic background um, and you want to be a QA or a QC person, you need to convince your future employer that you're really good at this, that you're really good at looking at an SOP and that uh, you can see all the all the little details on it uh, and that you think on the broader space of, okay, uh, what are the things that, that we need to look into terms of, of, of quality assurances, for example, that uh, everything is calibrated. Uh, if you're doing a test to make sure that your product is working, that you have the right controls, that everything is calibrated in the right way and that you're very good at setting up an experiment. Um, that's what you need to convince uh, these people on, to, I think, yeah. The next question from Prince Kakani uh, is, what kind of culture system you use for IPSCs since they need to be produced for large scale use? How long is the process of muscle differentiation? All right, so we are working um, upscaling in bioreactors. So we adapt our IPSCs from 2D to a 3D uh, uh, suspension culture. So they grow basically on big tank uh, bioreactors where they're floating. And with this, you, have, you don't have the, the limitations that you have with 2D, which has to do with, with the space, right? Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of also not, not only in the, in the meat uh, field, but also in, in terms of clinical, because you can imagine that also clinically, if you want to grow an organ or a tissue, uh, uh, you need to reach quite an amount of cells. So that, that's also being, being done uh, in clinic. Of course, our scale up, it, it's quite different. Uh, but yeah, they work uh, bioreactors. If you look at uh, bioreactors and bioengineering processing, that's, that's a lot of, of how you upscale this. And what was the second part of the question? Sorry. How long is the process of muscle differentiation? So currently with the OptioX, our uh, differentiation, our cells, our IPSC differentiate in seven to 10 days. Okay, next question is from Rebecca Rossen Falk. Uh, the quality of animal sourced meat is affected by, among others, maturation of the meat. Can you copy the biochemical processes that happen during the maturation? Yes, that's a very good question. And that's a, actually a very big topic in the tissue engineering team. So one of the things that we are working on is, for example, a simulation of the muscle, right? Uh, you go to the gym, you grow muscles. Uh, that's what we want to do also. So we're working on electrical and mechanical stimulation methods so that we can mature uh, our meat. Um, next question is from Injani. Would you save previous experience with IPSCs would be absolutely essential to be a part of your team as an R&D scientist, or would you consider other technical proficiencies like cell culture in general as well? Uh, yes, that's a really good question. Um, it depends on what you're looking for. So uh, my team is responsible for, for different type of type, uh, things during the cell line development. There's a part of the okay generation of, of, of the cell lines. Uh, we have a lot of molecular cell biology involved on that. Um, it depends on the project. It depends on what is our question. Uh, uh, so no, short answer, no, it doesn't have, it's not an essential, uh, it's a good to have, uh, but it's not an essential uh, requisite. Uh, next question is from Florian Aust. Can you recommend platforms or courses where you can learn to develop soft skills like communication or project development parallel to one's study? Yeah, that's that's a, uh, in short, I really I'm not 100 percent aware of, of courses uh, that can help you with that, honestly, um, during it was something that I developed also during my job uh, at Meetable, um, and it was something that I think you will come to realize that you do 
have those skills. You did acquire those skills during your uh, PhD, for example. You just don't realize it. Uh, and it's something that I also had to learn that like, oh, I, I, I do have a feeling for this. Uh, it's something that I had to do during my PhDs and you just didn't know how to call it, for example. So I think that there's a lot, a lot, a lot of things that you can find uh, around uh, for it. And um, the more you start reading about it, the more you will understand, oh, but I actually have done this. Uh, I actually know this and you will know how to class classify or how to put it on a box and saying actually I do know about this so I'll my uh, advice for you is, is to search around and see what do they mean by project management and, and and write down what are the skills and what are the things that you think you you know uh, next question from Sinan uh, do you find it possible to switch to different departments in your organization if one becomes interested in another department during their work Yes, definitely. We are very, uh, so we work all, all of us, we work all very together. All the different departments or the different groups, we need our knowledge. Uh, and it's, it's a nice, it, and it's nice, uh, uh, really nice interdisciplinary uh, group. And of course, uh, uh, it, it actually happened already that we had some, some colleagues that were like, oh, actually, I really would like to work in that question. And, and that, yeah, so it is easy, yeah. Yulia wants to know, what are the challenges that you experienced working in startups? How do you work on them? So, of course, the main challenge is that when I started, we, we were five people at Mutable and we're close to 40 now. So it has been a, a big growth. Um, the main challenge is, is that somehow you're, uh, we like to say it also like this, you're flying the plane while building it. So you need to be quite flexible. Um, you need uh, main challenges ha have to do with um, uh, you're building the structures of it, right? Uh, for example, when we started, we didn't have like a, a salary framework uh, or HR was just building up. Uh, uh, so you need to be you need to be aware that most of, of those structures that you would have on a fully accomplished company or, or a bigger company, you don't have them there. And you also need to adjust your expectations to that. You need to understand, for example, okay, our pension uh, was not, uh, it was not something that it was uh, de defined. It will be, uh, but you need to adjust your expectations to that. For example, a pension system, now we have it working, uh, a salary framework, now we have it working. Um, um, so we're, you need to adjust a little bit of your expectations when you start. And then, of course, um, uh, a startup, you always have that uh, uh, a little bit of uncertainty. You, you're not generating money yet, um, but you need to trust the people that are working with that. For example, our CEO and our, uh, um, and our CTO, you, you need to trust the people that you're working with. And uh, somehow um, that was one of the things that made me start with, with Meetable exactly. I was, I was wondering about that. Uh, oh my God, I'm going to get into something that I don't know how's the future of it. And the first talks that I had uh, with them during my interviews, I realized that they had oh, so many things thought off. Like I had so many questions, but they really thought about it. And I was like, okay, I, I do trust that they are thinking on everything. So you need to be a little bit adventurous and, and uh, be a little bit flexible and curb your expectations, I would say. Uh, next question is from Sarah Hendler. Uh, she asks, sorry if I missed it, do you have dry lab people in your, in your team, like computational mathematics, physics, or data science? Yes, we're working on that. So actually, uh, uh, we're uh, looking into uh, bioinformatics people. Uh, where, yes, so it's a yes. We, we don't have them at the moment, but we're seeing the need more and more for it. So yes. Um, Sarah Schweighofer asks, do you exchange knowledge with your real competitors like Goodmeat uh, from Singapore, for example, and are your factory or labs open for visitors? All right. So we don't exchange knowledge per se. We know more or less what each other is uh, doing. We know what type of cell lines, what are the bets that you're having. But of course, you're still industry. You still in, the, in that sense, you're not sharing knowledge with it. What we are doing, and, and because this is quite of, of a, a big thing in terms of regulatory in food, it's the first time it hasn't been approved per se. Um, we are we're all, all many companies are working together. Also here in Europe, one of the things that that we developed is with other other com other startups in the field. 
that you develop a kind of an association to try and go talk together as, as the whole industry, uh, talk with the regulatory approvals, um, the regulatory committees and, and work with them to try to understand what are the things that we need to show, how this will work on the future. In that sense, we're all working as one big block uh, because we want it to work for everyone, but in terms of, of the knowledge and, and of course, that's your know-how, that's your money-making uh, system uh, eventually. So we are currently out of time. Uh, thank you a lot for your talk and for answering the questions. If anyone else has more questions in the audience, you can join us later for the speed dating session. Yes, thank you, so uh, thank you Maria, and have a nice day. Thank you.